Hello and welcome to RBC Online today. It's great to be here, Mike. Good to be here with you today. Yeah, and you too, Dan. How you going? I'm doing very well. I'm doing very well. And uh, looking forward, though, to being together uh, and having some time to worship together and to open God's Word uh, yeah. today. Yeah. Today, uh, we have um, uh, Craig Broman, who's going to be bringing God's Word today. We finish yeah. our Sabbath series, but more about yeah. that uh, later on. Yeah, that's right. And looking forward to that. It's going to be, it is a great message. I have already heard it. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but so I just wanted to share uh, from Psalm 67 as right. we uh, come uh, today. It says, uh, may God show us his favor and bless us. May he smile mm. on us. Then those living on the earth will know what you are like. All nations will know how you deliver your people. Let the nations thank you, O God. Let all the nations thank you. Mm. Let foreigners rejoice and celebrate. For you execute justice among the nations and govern the people living on the earth. Let the nations thank you, O God. Let all the nations thank you. The earth yields its crops. May God, our God, bless us. Mm. May God bless us then all the ends of the earth will give him the honour that he deserves. Amen. So today, let us come and draw near to God. Yeah. Yeah, we know that we, yeah, in order to be experiencing his blessings, yeah. Yeah, we, we can't be closed people. Yeah. We have to be open and, to him and experience And, and what a God we see there. Yeah. One who um, is love, one who is on about justice and those who are oppressed and the foreigner. Like, so we can come with confidence that we serve a God who is good and loving and includes all yeah, yeah yeah so i encourage us let us come as a community together yeah. um, and praise him for yeah. his goodness and blessings to us Thank you. 
Hey everyone, welcome to our last week of the Make Wave series, which we've been following through June and July. We've been looking at the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, and this week we'll be focusing on self-control. Our teaching is from James chapter 3, verse 1 to 6. And James, our uh, words have power, and James uses imagery like... Um, ship's rudder, a horse pit, and even fire to show us how powerful our words can be and how difficult and sometimes impossible it is to control. But we don't have to worry because we have the Holy Spirit to help us. Let's go watch the video. The Bible, it's 66 books of history, stories, letters, and poetry that fit together to form God's one big story. The epic adventure of how he created us and loves us so much that he made a way to rescue us. As we travel through the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, we discover people who met God and found their lives changed forever. Inspired by the book of James, 
chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. The book of James in the New Testament was most likely written by, aha, you guessed it, James. But this James wasn't just a close friend or follower of Jesus. James was actually Jesus's brother. <laughs> okay, can you imagine growing up with Jesus as your brother? He and James might have wrestled or played ball or uh, thought of inventions just like any other brothers. But eventually, James also came to believe that Jesus is God's son, the one sent to save the entire world. <laughs> Mind blown. I, James, am writing this letter. I serve God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, think about it seriously. What would it take for you to even consider that your brother was the savior of the world? James saw that the power of God's spirit was with Jesus, and James himself experienced that same power when Jesus returned to heaven. In his letter to a group of Jesus followers, James shares some practical wisdom. He makes it clear that if you believe in Jesus and rely on the power of God's spirit, then your life should look like it. My brothers and sisters, most of you shouldn't become teachers. That's because you know that those of us who teach will be held more accountable. All of us get tripped up in many ways. Suppose someone is never wrong in what they say, then they are perfect. They're able to keep their whole body under control. James wrote that one of the toughest things you'll ever have to control in life is you. The things you do, and especially the things you say, make a big difference in the world around you. And just like Jesus used stories, James painted some pretty amazing word pictures to help us understand. We put a small piece of metal in the mouth of a horse to make it obey us. We can control the whole animal with it. Think of a horse. Horses are strong, powerful animals. But when this tiny piece of metal is placed in a horse's mouth, even a small person can easily control that huge horse. James gives another word picture too. And how about big ships? They are very big. They are driven along by strong winds, but they are steered by a very small rudder. It, it makes them go where the captain wants to go. Imagine a huge sailing ship. Some ships built now are so big, they're like floating cities. But ships don't come with brakes. They can't be stopped over a short distance. That makes it super important for a pilot to be able to steer easily. Here's what directs the ship, a rudder. Compared to that ginormous floating city of a ship, the rudder is tiny, but a single adjustment in the angle of the rudder controls the path of that entire ship. Not too long ago, there was this huge container ship called the Ever Given that was traveling through the very narrow Suez Canal. Well, the winds were really high and the pilot just lost control. The rudder of that ship didn't do its job and that huge container ship wedged tight. The canal was blocked for six days. Hundreds of ships were stuck behind it and couldn't pass. Shipping around the whole world was backed up. All of that could have been prevented if the pilot had controlled the ship's rudder. Which brings us back to this. In the same way, the tongue is a small part of a person's body, but it talks big. Everything that comes out of your mouth and the words that you write or type can change the direction of your day, your week, your entire life. Maybe your best friend makes you mad and a really mean insult pops into your head. If you let that fall out of your mouth, it could just ruin the day for both of you and even destroy your entire friendship. James gives us one more word picture to illustrate how important it is to control what we say. Think about how a small spark can set a big forest on fire. The tongue is also a fire. Fire can be a great thing. Imagine a cozy bonfire for toasting marshmallows. If you're outside on a freezing night, a blazing fire can even be life-saving. But those same flames can destroy life too. A tiny spark can flare into a huge wildfire within minutes. And that wildfire can race along at seven miles an hour through the forest or 14 miles an hour over grassland. It can destroy everything in its path. 
James wrote that we need to take our words as seriously as wildfire. Every word that comes out of your mouth has the power to give life and encouragement or to hurt and destroy. That is a huge responsibility. And there's no way you can fully control your words or yourself on your own. But if you ask for God's help, you will be given the power of God's Spirit. And as James reminds us, you can choose your words wisely. And then what you say will begin to change your world for good. Our bottom line is that God gives us the power of self-control. And self-control can be tricky, especially when things don't go our way or when we want something really badly. Our words have power, but God helps us with self-control. We don't have to do it by ourselves. I hope you really enjoyed our series that we've done uh, through June and July. And see you all next week. Well, thanks to the kids team for good. leading us through. Um, yeah, another way that we worship. Um, it is uh, great to engage and you know, just see it through the eyes of a, a child a little bit. It's, it's, yeah. always, it's always amazing. One of the bits of feedback we get. You know, yeah. I'm a preacher, you preach. And uh, generally people, I think, appreciate our messages. Yeah. Everyone loves the kids section. <laughs> yeah. right? It's like, that's the piece everyone just says. You know, yeah, the messages yeah. that come through there. So we know if you're an adult out there or you're a parent, we know that that's for you too, okay? Yeah, so it's not yeah. just for the kids, but you get a lot out of that as well. Yeah. Hey, well, Mike, just a few things to uh, let people know about. Uh, yeah. Today, we, we actually conclude our um, series uh, in the Sabbath, and we'll yes. talk about this later on. Yeah. Uh, but that, uh, yeah, we've got Craig Broman coming. But as I said, we'll speak about that later on. But we want to have a way to wrap this up well with mm. a little celebration time. And so on Saturday, uh, the 6th of August at 1 uh, p.m. Uh, in the uh, in the hall at, uh, at the RBC property, property. we're having a, an afternoon that we're calling a Sabbath celebration and a time of delighting God. Mm. There'll be a time of song and worship, uh, scripture reading, some activities, some family fun. And so we encourage you to be part of that. If you want to come along to that, you can just head to the hub and yep. you can register at the hub uh, to be part of our Sabbath celebration. Also, next Sunday is Enrich Life Sunday, and uh, I'll share more about that next week, but got a, a special word that speaks into uh, the importance of Enrich Life and that ministry, and yep. so that'll be uh, next uh, week. And just the other final thing to let you know about is um, check your email for the hello for a link to a survey on our RBC values. We're yeah. spending some time just looking at uh, the values that we want for our church in the future. And so we want to hear from you. And so please check that link and uh, get that survey done. It'll mm. take about 10 minutes or so. Yeah, yeah, it'd be great. It'd be great. And um, we also have the opportunity to come as an act of worship and, and yep. give uh, today. It's something that we do each week and you can see details of how we do that uh, on the screen. But I just want to take this moment now uh, to pray uh, for our offering. So let's come and do that. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. Um, as we mentioned at the start of this service, uh, for all of your blessings and your goodness uh, towards us. And um, yeah, you know, we, we can... Um, we can search within ourselves and realize that maybe we don't deserve all of that, but we, um, you know, we offer up this, this praise and thanks uh, towards you for everything you give us. And uh, as, as we come now and um, you know, think about what we are uh, going to give or um, you know, on what we have already given maybe, maybe, uh, yeah, I, pr I pray that you would uh, use that money. You would use that time even that we're setting aside uh, to yeah, further your kingdom, we pray. And um, yeah, we pray that people will come to know you uh, because of it. We pray, pray that people will come uh, to experience your blessings and your goodness for themselves. Yes. And um, yeah, we just pray uh, for the people who are going to distribute, uh, especially the money, Lord, that um, yeah, you would just have your hand uh, over all of that and may it go to uh, the places that need it. Yes. And uh, we just uh, yeah, give it over to you wisely yes pray this in your name amen amen well today uh we have craig broman here yeah. craig's uh yeah. is a loved preacher across this community he preaches mm. here 
uh, probably once a, once a year or so I like to get him in. Yeah. Uh, he uh, does a lot of significant work with workers in the city, mm -hmm. uh, those who are looking to share their faith yeah. uh, in their businesses or places of employment. And uh, so he's just a, he's just a ripper guy. And yeah. so he yeah. works with an organisation called Engage Work Faith. Uh, you can check out uh, more of them online. And so really we just want to encourage you to, to do that and to think through even uh, if you are a, uh, a marketplace leader or a business uh, leader and you're in the city, then um, check him out. Like, mm. Get engaged with him. He does yeah. lots of uh, Bible studies and devotions uh, with people and just wants to support you in your role to uh, engage well with those who are not yet followers of Jesus in the workplace. Yeah, so. yeah. And he's going to be wrapping up our uh, Sabbath series yep. uh, with a message I think is entitled uh, The Future of Rest. Correct. Um, so it is a good one. Get, get your Bibles out and your uh, notepads and um, yeah, let's enjoy this together. Well, hello, my name is Craig Broman and I work with Engage Workplace, uh, a workplace mission, and we exist uh, because Jesus transforms all of life and that actually includes your work as well. And today I have the privilege of finishing a seven part series on uh, redeeming restfulness. And as I look out, you must be so rested and reposed and reinvigorated and refreshed. Um, it's a great subject to be covering uh, over the last six weeks and great stuff for those of you who've actually made your way through all um, six sermons. So I hope it's brought a large or incremental change to the way that you do life. And uh, Dan kicked off the series uh, and he set the scene by saying that we're living in a culture uh, which is full of hurry sickness. And as technology gives us greater capacity, we can do more and more, uh, we can fit more into our lives. He concluded with this uncomfortable observation of modern church culture. He said, we may love God deeply, but we just don't know how to sit with God anymore. And Melinda Cousins reinforced the delight that we can have in the Sabbath, uh, it's been designed for us. Um, it's not there for us to be shoehorned into um, and to serve it. And then Dan went on to point out that the Sabbath also is there as a bit of a resistance um, to not go back to a world of enslavement, which is what happened, uh, what was the warning for the Israelites after they left um, Egypt. And he called us to an exodus from a life of having to do more and more and more. You've looked at family, parenting and rest, and last week you looked at Sabbath and our nine to five work. I ride my bike into the city each day, and a couple of times a week on the return trip, I take the scenic route, route through the uh, West Terrace Cemetery. The first thing you notice when you take that ride is the hush that come o comes over the peak hour of the day. You cycle past the graves of people and you look at some of the headstones and you realise some people work very, very hard through their lives. Some people have had their dreams cut short. Some people were loved passionately. Other people barely tolerated their fellow human beings. Some worried about stuff. Others expected life to deliver more for them. But what they all had in common was that the dust of their bustling lives gathered and finally settled here in that place. And the phrase on every second gravestone that you came across uh, was a collective hope, rest in peace. It's sobering to do that five-minute detour on my way home because I realise one day I'll join them maybe not at 
uh, the West Terrace Cemetery, but I will join them inevitably. Most of this series you've been looking back, back at creation, back at the Sabbath and why it was put there, but today we're going to strain our eyes and look forward. We're going to press forward and look at what sort of rest could be secured for us when we finally rest in peace. And to do that, we need to look at how Jesus secured rest. We need to look at how being a Christian is a type of resting on someone else's work. We're going to have a quick look at what can threaten that rest and the great warnings not to neglect moving to that rest. And then the irony of struggling to rest this side of paradise. So, a quick cursory glance at the Gospels will show you that Jesus constantly was juggling work and rest. We see this, his humanity and his need for rest, his t teaching on rest, his radical claims of being the Lord of rest at points. And this last claim was the tipping point for the Jewish leadership of the days. Uh, that, that led to the plot of his death in John chapter 5. And if you really want to understand the sort of rest that God holds out to us, then it all culminates with what goes on at the cross. How does dying on a cross make Jesus the Lord of rest? If you read the accounts of the crucifixion, Jesus is writhing, he is calling out with a loud voice, There's, this is not a peaceful, this is not at all a quiet moment of slipping away. He is restless. Why is he restless? Well, I'm very thankful to Tim Keller for his insight at this point. And he points towards Isaiah 57 verse 20. And this is what it says. The wicked are like a tossing sea which cannot rest, whose waves cast up mire and mud. There is no peace for the wicked. The wicked are restless. And on the cross, Jesus takes up all that wickedness in us and our world, all our sin, all our restlessness. In his writhing, he is experiencing infinite restlessness, humanity's restlessness over all time, the cosmic restlessness in this world. Why? Well, because he's securing rest through the process. He goes through all this turmoil and then his last words are this, it is complete. It's over. No more doing. No more wrestling. It's, it's a great window into what a Christian actually is. A Christian can say, you know, I rest not on my works but on his. I rest on the utterly perfect and completed work of Jesus. God accepts me, not because of my record, but because of his. A Christian is rest assured, if you like. They're secured outside of themselves. In contrast, our wider culture struggles to rest like that. One of the dangers of technology, and more recently of COVID, causing us to work from home, is that work and rest have become this sort of strange confection that's been pushed together. We never quite leave work when we're at home, so we find it really hard to get back to work and the rhythms of work the following day. Work is sort of ground down to a fine powder and it's, it's sprinkled, its dust is sprinkled through every single part of our lives. There's no boundaries, there's no definitive break. So as Christians, we need to have a recalibrated mindset when it comes to rest. Christians can be thermostats at this point, setting the temperature on the issue of rest. But sadly, often they're like thermometers that merely reflect the wider culture of restlessness, where our Medal of Honor is Longer days, busier work hours, more crammed diaries. Alex Pang's book entitled, Why You Get More Done When You Rest, in that 
he puts the research out there which says that you get far more, far more better results from people when they rest. Deliberate rest will give you sharper ideas, it will give you greater reflection, more creativity, better health and well-being. Without rest, there's no chance for you to think through, who am I? Where am I heading? Is this what I really want to do with my life? Now, I know this principle of rest from going to the gym. So the person that I go to the gym with, uh, he's taught me to rest between exercises. If I'm doing a specific combination of exercises and I'm repeating them three times, I time the rest now between those exercises. Or if I don't, I hurry the whole thing along and the exercise becomes increasingly futile. Now, nature underlines that principle as well. If you, you know, you're interested in gardening, you have um, veggie beds at home, you know that it's very important to keep rotating the crops around and give the soil a rest. When it comes to cooking, you know, there's nothing nicer than a steak that's been allowed to rest before it's served. And yet, at the same time, we think we can live without rest. You know, that night and day, without the seasons, without the rhythm of the week, and the whole thing just turns into a blamange of twilight. Kevin DeYoung, in his book, Crazy Busy, points out that we actually get two and a half hours less sleep than our counterparts from a century ago. And theologian Don Carson, he lists sleep deprivation as one of the six possible causes of doubting God. What is he saying? He's saying, well, sometimes the godliest thing that you might say to yourself is, I need to get a good night's sleep tonight. Listen to the caution of Psalm 127. In vain you rise up early and go to bed late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. Every time you go to sleep, in effect you down tools and you say, well, I'm not God. I have to leave it in the hands of the one who is. But our world is more than just struggling to rest. The world is also eroding that rest that Jesus secured. And the book of Hebrews in the New Testament depicts the Christian life as one great long journey with the goal at the end of reaching God's rest. So if you have a look up now, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 to 11, on your phone or your device, then you can see with me what it's saying about rest. It draws a parallel. The Old Testament people of God they were rescued from slavery. They were led out of Egypt to a place of rest. It was a dangerous journey. They had to go through a wilderness along the way and the people wavered in their trust that God could get them home. He could get them to a place of rest. And then that prolonged their unhappy journey and it resulted in a whole generation dying in the wilderness. Now, what's the point of telling that story for the recipient's of that letter, the letter to the Hebrews. Well, in a wave of hostility to this new thing called Christianity, it was very easy for converted Jews who had become Christians to retreat back underneath the umbrella of Judaism to be protected. It might temporarily take the blowtorch off them if it was attracting persecution. But the person who wrote the letter to the Hebrews knew that it would also be a denial of everything that Jesus had won for them at the cross. They would stop resting on the finished work of Christ and they would return to their own efforts and their own achievements. And that sort of a reversal was unthinkable to the writer of this letter. So Hebrews 4 unpacks three key truths about rest that take it far beyond the Jews in the middle of the wilderness in the Old Testament. The first is this, God's rest existed before the promised land was a thing. If you have a look at verses three and four, God's rest existed before the promised land was even a thing. Secondly, God's rest remained after the promised land. It still remains that some will enter that rest, verse six. And the third thing is God's rest is actually open to us today. 
verses 9 and 11. There remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. So Hebrews equates ultimate rest with entering God's kingdom in the future. Otherwise, they would have got it already when Joshua took them into the promised land. The rest of completion that God proclaims at creation is what he now longs for all people to enter. And we experience sort of in part now um, with the Holy Spirit taking up residence in our life, but we don't have the whole thing. We don't have all the box and dice of it. And that experience of the part holds us to the future. And that rings true in other areas of life, other areas of life for us. You know, the knowledge that the weekend is coming will keep you in place during a hell of a week at work. Um, the hope of a ceasefire when the war is raging in the middle of Ukraine will keep people alive and hopeful. This delayed gratification in what Hebrews impresses on us is what we're called for. The pursuit of eternal rest is costly, it's like a pilgrimage, it's like a journey where the disciple at the end of their days ceases from their labours as God did from his. A Andrew Del Banco in The American Dream, he says, and this is very, very, very shrewd and accurate. He says, hope is the way we overcome the lurking suspicion that all of our getting and spending amounts to fidgeting while we wait for death. You know, there is absolutely no question that rest is coming for a Christian. And you have to hold on. You have to hold on to that hope or else you will become undone. How does that compare that picture of the future with your own picture of what rest is at the present? Perhaps it's a deep soaking bath for your tired muscles. Perhaps it's a deserted beach fringed by palm trees. Perhaps it's curling up in front of a crackling fire when the wind's howling outside. Whatever it is, unconsciously, you will equate it to eternity when you sigh, ah, this is just heaven. As COVID retreats eventually and as travelling overseas becomes normal again, not a novelty, when you finally make it to your long service leave or you buy that beach shack that you've been always after, I have to break it to you. It can't sustain the sort of rest that you're hoping for from it. Tim Keller describes this as a deep inner machinery wired in our DNA constantly murmuring for eternity. And God's picture of rest eclipses whatever you come up with in your head and whatever you so often settle for and then realise doesn't deliver. C.S. Lewis captures the irony. He says we're half-hearted creatures fooling about with sex and drink and ambition when infinite joy is offered us, like an, an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he can't imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We're far too easily pleased. Far too easily pleased. So striving to rest, what does it look like? It's not doing more work. Hebrews' picture of rest is costly. Becoming more like Jesus, not just something that you flop over the finish line and collapse and say, oh, I've made it now. The word strive here in verse 11 is used to describe the intense concentration of energy necessary to reach your desired goal. It begs the question over what things have you done that for in life? given your absolute intense concentration and of energy to achieve that goal. Maybe it's a house, maybe it's toys, maybe it's travel, romance, family, your career. I don't know. But striving for what's inferior will exhaust you. The desire to squeeze more in. How do you know if your drivenness is actually flawed? Well, here are some diagnostic questions. Do I 
check work emails and phone messages long after I've knocked off? Do people preface their requests to me by saying, oh, I didn't want to trouble you, I know you're always so busy? Do family and friends complain that they don't get enough of you? If you have young children, do you pray with them regularly? Do you have enough time to even pray for yourself? Do you have a hobby in which you can become so absorbed you forget to eat? Do you stop to eat together with others at least once a day? Life really teaches us not to neglect our need for rest. It results in shallow relationships, health risks, addictions. All Hebrews is doing is taking that negative result of human beings failing to take physical rest and applying it brilliantly to spiritual rest to warn us not to miss out on appropriating God's ultimate answer to human restlessness. Verse 11, let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. You know, that's the Christian life. It's a day by day, week by week, hour by hour proposition of trusting and resting on the promises of God until you get home. It's being captured by a vision that chooses rest over restlessness constantly. Now, here are some tips, I think, for how you can secure rest. One, keep working it out with other Christians. Don't try and just do it on your own. Get some other people and brainstorm how you're going to do leisure. How are you going to rest? How are you going to put work in its proper place? How can you keep yourself from being overwhelmed by what you do? What are the distractions that take your eyes off future rest? Number two, practice that real rest now. It won't be enough for you to work like a demon and then take some time off. It has, it's got to be more than that. You, it means fewer goals, not trying to have it all, maybe saying no to a promotion interstate or overseas because you sense that it's going to distract you from following Jesus ultimately. One person tells me the reason that they can say no so confidently to people is because they always picture in their head that they've said yes to something else prior to that. Third, make yourself accountable for a busy patch in your life. All of us have them. I mean, you can't always have a week where everything's just pegged out nicely with a rest here and a rest there. Sometimes when you've got a new project or a new role or you're starting up a new business, it's going to require overwork from you. And perhaps it's going to go on for a while. But say to somebody in all this you trust and love, when the time's up, please come and tell me and stop me because I don't want to make living my life at this sort of pace normative. Fourth, build unstructured time into your diary and into your life. That, that, that's time that's just unplanned, undiarized, time where you give your body and your soul and your mind a chance to free will and things can just bubble to the top that haven't had a chance in your busyness. Several years ago now, I preached at a service where the governor of South Australia was present. She was a guest, and that weekend, she had toured the Air Peninsula after the horrific fires and the loss of life that had occurred up there. And while I was preaching, I just noticed that she was starting to sob. So after the service, there was a little moment where we could talk, and I asked her, I said to her, you know, what was all, what, what was it in the sermon that triggered that? And she looked at me and said, well, there was, it was nothing in the sermon, Craig. Um, actually, that's the first time in this last week that I've had to stop and process what I've actually seen. And I just started to cry. See, there is an unhelpful drivenness in human beings and it's, we're trying to validate our space that we occupy up in this universe. And we say, you know, here's my justification for being here. And it's a wearing task and we never know whether we've done quite enough. And so we keep proving to ourselves and to those around us that we love and even to our enemies 
that we're worthy to be here. And surely there is a better way to live that doesn't wear you to the bone and re-enslave you. Am I truly resting in what Jesus works so hard to secure for me? The man who strove to build bigger barns to store his harvest, Jesus pronounced an absolute fool. Striving, it needs to have the right focus at the end of the day. Entering that rest that Jesus secures for us at the cross, trying to appropriate that, it requires persistence, it requires your focus, it requires not slipping back into a flawed and inferior offering. As Christians, we need to be advocating rest in our workplaces with the people around us. We need to be leading them on what rest really is. It's our point of difference to the well-being movement. It's an outworking of how God has liberated us and rescued us. The final weekly habit for this series is the suggestion that you go and take a long, slow walk. Not trying to get anywhere in particular, putting your phone on silent and heightening your awareness of your surroundings and yourself and of God. An awareness walk, if you like. Now, I didn't realise it, but I did this a few years back. My wife and I were at a week-long conference in Oxford. It was the end of a long trip, and life had thrown us a curveball along the way, and my wife uh, was recovering where we were staying from an emergency operation that she had to have to reattach both retinas to her eyes. She had spent the week sitting in a chair 24-7 for seven days straight, not able to move from that position while I attended the conference with some workers from South Australia. And it got to the last day in Oxford. And I woke early in the morning, and that was the day we were flying back to Oz. And I went for a walk along the river and then through Oxford. And it took me up through Christchurch Meadow, for those of you who know that spot, then back up and along the high street past all the beautiful buildings there. And it was one of those magical days. It was just a blue, clear sky, English day. There was a soft, light breeze. It was warm. It was verdant green everywhere. There were reminders of C.S. Lewis's Narnia and every lamppost and uh, carved fawns on the doorways to places and towering beech trees. And the conference was finished. I there was no rush. I didn't have to be anywhere. I just walked. I walked with God. I knew his presence. I drank in the magical moment that was captured in time for me. So beautiful. I just spontaneously wept. If I could describe to you what I think heaven will be like, it was that day, that place. It was the closest thing. And to think that when I got up, I nearly bailed so I could do more packing. That's the sort of long awareness walk you might need at the moment. The closing pages of the Bible say this, Blessed are those who die in the Lord, for they shall rest from their labours. Revelation 14, 13. You know, that tension between work and rest finally will be resolved when we get there and we'll kick back and we'll reflect on all that's been done for us and join God's chorus at creation. We'll say, this is good. You know, this is really good. Thanks for listening.
eyes on me. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. It's been great to be together again today and to hear from Craig and yep. what a great message to close off our our series. Yeah, it's definitely. been a, a great seven weeks and I know for many people uh, learning the art of Sabbathing yeah, uh, yeah. has been uh, has been important for people. I think the way that Craig just um, yeah brought us to that as an end um, was great. I particularly yeah. love um, what was his what was one of his last points there around make yourself accountable. Uh, for busy patches in our lives. Yeah. And, uh, I yeah. really resonated with that because it's so quickly, and I think we've shared over this series that a day can turn into a week, a week can yeah. turn into a month, a month into a season, all of a sudden yeah. we've just got a lifestyle. Yeah, that's yeah. right. That's right. So I was even, um, I guess it's an important thing for us to remember as we finish this series that just because uh, we might not be particularly targeting into Sabbath every Sunday like we've done. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This is a principle still that is important for us. It's not just for seven weeks, mm. but how can you continue to uh, outwork the principle and the practice of Sabbath in your life and in your family? Mm. And so I want to encourage you, don't just shelve this. Yeah. This is, yeah. Uh, this is critical uh, for us. Um, could could look like just you know we've had our weekly habits. Could look yep. like just one of those one of those habits you're going to try and put into your life as a yep. as a regular Correct. regular thing. You know, what might be one that you really resonated with, or you know, just um, even as Craig put it, you know, having unstructured time, time. within your life, yes. like you know, something Give something some like margin. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, what what's one one or two things you can you can pull out and really uh, engage with. Uh, Going forward, going forward in your life yeah, yeah. and one way uh, is this don't forget as a last minute plug for the yeah. Sabbath celebration on the 6th of August 1 o'clock in the church yeah. encourage you to be part of that that would just be a way too that you can uh, see uh, some things that you could even do on your Sabbath some people wondering you know, what do we actually do yeah. uh, what can we do well you'll see a few examples on the day as well for Definitely. that so Definitely. go to the hub to register for that yeah. If you'd like prayer uh, for today, um, yep. uh, for anything that's on your heart or requests that you have, uh, the hosts are there and uh, would love to pray uh, with you. Um, and of also encourage you uh, throughout the week to engage with us on a, on a Facebook group yep. as well. You can find us obviously online on uh, the Facebook and um, yeah, you just be able to uh, engage with us yeah, throughout the week as we um, yeah, do life together. And that's Great. an important part uh, of life to earth and uh, and this community of being here mm. on um, on being online yeah well uh, god bless and uh we'll see you uh next week any more information that you need you can check out our socials or yeah. play around with the menu bar above so all right god bless see you next week <laughs>